matter of historical research, but less obvious for history education or forms of historical popularization. Only to the extent that teachers, history textbooks, or classroom discussions display research characteristics, do the same parallels appear. <clears throat> Historical writing and democracy also show two important procedural differences. Instead of parallels, differences. The role of compromise and the place of quality control. Compromise is central to quality, but secondary to science. At the level of statements of fact, the level at which truth tests are possible, scholars avoid compromise. The consensus theory, true is what the majority of scholars think is true, fails at this level, the level of facts. At the level of statements of opinion and inter interpretation, in contrast, compromise is sometimes possible. Historical interpretations and moral judgments are not true or untrue, but more or less plausible. And within certain margins, within certain margins, Compromise about, about plausibility is possible. Systematic quality control is another differentiating factor. Apart from an important phase of brainstorming during the pre-publication stage, the expression of opinions in science, including historical writing, is checked by a system of peer review. This renders the scientific debate far more regulated than the public debate. But once scholars accept this control of quality, their right to heresy is considerable. In some, historical writing is also characterized by procedures that deviate from democracy. The amplifier thesis makes a bolder claim. It maintains that responsible historical writing not only reflects but also strengthens a democratic society. Beyond the point that merely re reflecting democracy is already a way of strengthening it. It is reasonable to suppose that responsible historical writing if it is to strengthen democracy, it must be related not merely to its procedure, but also, and more so, to its content. Not just to any content, no, but to some democracy-related content. From the section about historical awareness with which I began my talk, two domains emerged as likely candidates to fulfill this condition of democracy-linked content, namely accounts of the history of democracy and accounts of historical injustice. Let us therefore see now how historical literacy in these two domains may boost democracy. Obviously, the first domain is the study of the history of democracy. A democratic society, including its younger generations, needs to understand the origin and development of the democracy in which it lives, to diagnose its present condition, and to debate about guarantees for its future. In other words, it must develop a strong democratic historical awareness, by which I mean an enduring sense of continuity with democratic precedents and discontinuity with non-democratic <coughs> precedents in its history. If such an account lacks, 
there is room for distortion and abuse of history. This takes society further away from democracy. Dealing with historical injustice, my second domain, is a core theme of any democracy as well. The United Nations emphasized that the people's knowledge of the history of its oppression is a part of its heritage. The people's knowledge of the history of its oppression is a part of its heritage that should be remembered. They called the inclusion of an accurate account of past human rights violations in educational material a form of symbolic reparation of historical injustice. Symbolic reparation. In general, it can be said that not dealing properly with past injustice by not investigating it, by not punishing it, continues that past injustice. And continuing past injustice increases the risk of recurrence of conflict and of non-democratic <coughs> rule, and so permanently threatens the existence of democracy. As I hold Nibu said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. It has been convincingly shown that the greater the grievances about past injustices are, the greater the potential for leaders of communal or political groups to initiate collective punitive action. The general democratic duty to deal with historical injustice includes a so-called state duty to investigate past atrocity. I have already said it. It is here that responsible historians next to states have an important role to play. Views of historical injustice <coughs> often differ sharply within a single society and give rise to multiple forms of historical awareness. When historians offer plausible interpretations of historical injustice, put into the context of the conflicts and non-democratic regimes in which it was inflicted, they disentangle, they disentangle the official versions of history and the widespread secrecy, silence, and lies that prevailed during this repressive past. Unveiling secrecy and breaking the silence mean exposure. Attacking lies means refutation. Dismantling distorted official versions mean burdening the interpretation frame to include the perspectives of society at large, including the victims. In so doing, historians help discontinue important aspects of historical injustice. accurate and plausible accounts of the history of democracy and of historical injustice then strengthen democracy. The reception of these accounts, these plausible accounts, by the public, however, can undermine the latter's democratic effect. First, it is a fact of life that the availability of reliable research findings does not imply their automatic and enlightened acceptance by the public. I should not tell this to an audience of history educators. <coughs> Second, revealing painful truths about the past may reopen old wounds and revive old conflicts. This may eventually discourage part of the audience to embrace democracy. Third, the findings of historians can be very well at odds 
with the promotion of human rights and democracy. Indeed, historical research and teaching may show the success of human rights, but just as easily their failure and the strength of democracy, but just as easily its weakness. And by the same token, the attraction of non-democratic alternatives. Alternatively, awareness of the fragile and temporary ca character of democracy can also stimulate the determination to defend it. I conclude that the contribution of responsible historical writing to strengthening democracy, to, to strengthening democracy is substantive, substantive, substantive rather than procedural when it deals with the study of democracy and of historical injustice, and although democratic effects can be mitigated or even eliminated on its reception. The midwife thesis finally holds that responsible historical writing, beyond reflecting and strengthening democracy, also shapes it as the dominant factor. There are defining moments in the life of a democracy in which the debates about history mark the public mind. We noted that this is most clearly seen in new or restored democracies, which are often characterized by a brief period of thirst for knowledge about the past, about the, the recent past. The instruments for this thirst, to still this thirst, are truth commissions and tribunals. But rarely, amazingly, but rarely historical writing. Historical writing typically needs more time and therefore usually comes too late to influence the first debates about recent injustice. The findings of historical works rarely set the agenda of democratic states. And if they do, only for a fleeting moment. It is true, however, that the value of historical works may be significantly enhanced in countries where the process of transitional justice does not take place immediately, but with a generation's delay, as was the case, for example, in Brazil. In general, however, the claim that historical writing is the midwife of democracy is weak. Its real impact is structural rather than incidental. I conclude. A democratic society is a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for sustained responsible historical writing. Conversely, responsible historical writing reflects democracy to a limited extent because parts of its procedure, of its operation, are a practical demonstration of values central to democracy. It invests, however, less compromise and more quality control in its operation than the democratic process does. Responsible historical writing also strengthens democracy to a limited extent when it presents plausible accounts of the histories of democracy and historical injustice. The provisional historical truth sought after and presented, however, is not always accepted by the public. If it is, it may open old wounds. If it does not, by showing failures, it may undermine the promotion of the mass. Finally, rarely does historical writing shape democracy directly. Nevertheless, the contribution 
of responsible historical writing to democracy, though limited, is necessary. There is no choice. For its own survival, a democratic society must facilitate a solid framework, framework in which reliable and plausible accounts of the past are offered to the public. Without such historical accounts, no strong democratic historical awareness is possible. Without such strong historical awareness, <coughs> the democratic culture is weakened, if not jeopardized, and so is democracy itself. The burden of the concomitant duties is shared by the state, the historians, the history teachers, in society at large. Responsible historical writing and democracy walk the same path to the end. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture about uh, the relation between historical writing and democracy and for explaining us how important the role of historians in a democracy is. But I can imagine there are questions in the audience. My name is Jeb, I'm a high school teacher or gymnasium teacher. Good name. I'm a little bit puzzled by the word uh, responsible and the definition of it. You know, um, you said that there's some kind of truth uh, out there. Uh, it sounds like Ranke in the 19th century. He is eigentlich business. Do you really believe that we can find some kind of truth? That's one question. The other is, um, I understood it as though that you believe there's some kind of laws in the development of you know, history, the, yeah, how uh, society is uh, evolved and developing. Do you really believe that? Can you repeat the second question? The second question, I understood it as though in your lecture that you can actually um, locate patterns in history that uh, are almost like science, you know, laws of, of natural science. Do you really believe that? Uh, did you understand my question? Uh, I think so. Okay. For the first part, uh, um, yes, I firmly believe in the possibility of historical truth. Yes, I do, without any hesitation. I believe that the core mission of historians and history teachers is searching for the historical truth in the first place. This is our first mission. So I have no problem in using.